Okay, should we pray as we come to God's word this morning? We thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you for your word, which is full of shining examples, ordinary people who have attempted to follow you faithfully. And so, Holy Spirit, this morning we ask that you uh, would just inhabit this time now as we look at your word. We pray that your spirit would be at work in our hearts and our minds, bringing the renewal that only you can bring. We ask that you will change our thinking. But more to the point, you'll change our behaviour in the week ahead. So touch us and speak to us now, we pray, Lord, uh, that we might become more like you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, so far in this sermon series, we have looked at six dimensions of prayer. We've noticed the priority that Jesus gave to prayer, and we've studied what he prayed for. We've looked at what St. Paul prayed for his church in Ephesus, and thought a bit about how we might pray for ourselves as a church. And we've also looked at listening to God, how we hear from him, how we discern his voice guiding us in everyday life. And this week we're looking at praying for the unlikely. In other words, how we pray for intractable situations. How we pray for those people who are not yet Christians and don't seem to want to be. The times when we find ourselves praying for outcomes that we can almost find it impossible to imagine. Which is why this week we are looking at the example of Nehemiah. But before we look at this uh, passage, perhaps a little bit of history might help us uh, interpret. The book of Nehemiah depicts events that happened some 500 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. In 586, Nebuchadnezzar's soldiers had marched out of Jerusalem, leaving behind them the smouldering remains of Solomon's 400-year-old temple. The holy city's most famous buildings, gates and walls had been completely levelled. Anyone who was above a peasant's status was forced marched all the way to Babylon behind their blinded king, a journey of some 900 miles, according to Google. As we join Nehemiah this morning, he's serving, of course, in the court of Artaxerxes, who was enthroned in Babylon between 464 and 423 BC. Nehemiah himself was brought to Jerusalem at around 445 BC. But as you study this passage over the next two weeks, remember too, if you remember nothing else, that Nehemiah was not special. He, if you like, was a bit like Simeon, who we looked at a fortnight ago. He wasn't a priest, he wasn't some kind of powerful politician, and he wasn't a prophet. Nehemiah is an ordinary person but an ordinary person with an extraordinary faith in God. Therefore, God does extraordinary things through him. So here is a man to inspire you over the next couple of weeks, because here we have the embodiment of obedience, a model of self-sacrifice, a warrior in prayer and a champion of faithfulness, a man who shows us what God can do if you will trust him. So if you're the kind of person who looks around this church on a regular basis and says in your conscience or in your heart, I'm not really as faithful as him or her, my prayers can't be nearly as powerful as theirs. Then this week, study this ordinary man, this lone prayer who is hundreds of miles from home, whose life revolves around being a cupbearer, as we heard in verse 11. We we can be ordinary, but we can still do, God can still do amazing things as a result of our prayers. The founder of the body shop, Anita Roddock, once said, if you feel that you are too small to be effective, then you have never been in bed with a mosquito. Prayers prayed by very ordinary people can still be powerful. They can still be used by God to achieve the unlikely. So what does this passage teach us about praying for unlikely outcomes? 
Well, firstly, we note, don't we, that Nehemiah commits himself to prayer. Nehemiah commits himself to prayer. As we read in verse 1, we learn that Nehemiah has been exiled for some 20 years. But nonetheless, he hasn't given up praying. Unlike me, he hasn't said he'll pray and then forgotten to do so. He hasn't started well and then gradually given up. Nehemiah has been praying faithfully for two decades. We see too, don't we, that he's also engaged in what he's praying for. At every opportunity, he seeks up-to-date information, verse 2. And then he sets aside quality time to pray in a really focused way about this issue, this issue that so burdens him, verse 4. I'm sure that in his time, Nehemiah, of course, prayed for lots of different things, people, issues, and groups like we do. But we see here that even after 20 years, the big thing that he is focused on praying for, he's still sticking at it. He's still praying for the unlikely, a restoration of God's people and God's holy city. Notice that when he hears that people are struggling and that the city is in ruins, Nehemiah is moved, isn't he? He's not indifferent. His heart's not hard. He actually enters into a time of mourning. He's so moved by it. You know, this tells us, doesn't it, that Nehemiah had a real heart for God's people and for God's city. A burden for them, if you like, that's inspired him to commit himself to praying for them for years and years and years. A soft heart is often the fruit of great prayer, prayerfulness, isn't it? Notice, too, that Nehemiah is so committed to prayer that he takes his burden to God and not to people. He takes his burden to God and not to people. You know, most of us take our problems to people, don't we? We share our woes with our friends and our families. In fact, anybody who'll listen. On the phone, on Facebook, on Twitter, again and again we go round and round in circles. But Nehemiah, you see, is a godly man. And so he takes his burdens to God alone in prayer. I wonder who you share most of your anxieties with. People, God, or a bit of both? In this passage, Nehemiah goes solely to God. As a Christian, ask yourself this week, do I take my troubles to God as readily as I take them to people? When you're faced with a big issue or a big ask, there is great wisdom, I think, in take, deciding, resolving, if you like, to actually just talk to God alone. Resolving not to talk about it endlessly with everybody you meet. Deciding not to play office politics over the email. Deciding not to join in the gossip. Some years ago, I was working in an advertising agency in London. One morning, my copywriter and I were summoned to the managing director's office and told that we'd been promoted to be joint creative directors of the creative department. This involved overseeing 16 creative teams and a PA. 24 hours later, I got a letter from the MD saying that as a result of this promotion, I'd be getting a pay rise of £3,000 which really annoyed me. This was peanuts, given the massive increase of responsibility, workload and pressure that I was going to endure. I considered writing him a stiff email expressing my displeasure there and then. But uncharacteristically, I decided to keep my mouth shut. In the morning, during my quiet time the next day, I resolved at that point to give it to God and to God alone, not to moan to him or to anyone else. A few days later, the MD's PA came into my office looking a bit flustered. She said, I've made a terrible mistake. I mistyped your letter. Your pay rise should have been £13,000, not three. Nehemiah takes his burden solely to God. If you and I want to hear inspiring testimonies from people we can never believe are going to believe, if we want to see people set free from life-threatening addictions, if we want to baptise more than one person a year, if we want to see closed doors opening, then like Nehemiah, we need to commit ourselves as individuals and as a church to praying. Take our anxieties, our burdens to God and not to people. Secondly, we see that Nehemiah keeps his God bigger than his problems. Nehemiah keeps his God bigger than his problems. This week, have a look at verses 5 to 11 of this passage and use Nehemiah's prayers to revitalise yours. 
For here we see that Nehemiah, as he's praying, keeps God great. Unlike my prayers, Nehemiah's aren't full of his anxieties. Instead, he begins by focusing on just how big God is. Have a look at verse 5 in this passage. You'll notice that he begins his prayers with the words, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God. It reads almost like an Old Testament version of the Lord's Prayer, doesn't it? If you are praying for a faith-stretching issue or a spiritually stubborn person, why not begin your quiet times this week by reminding yourself just how great God is? That's what Nehemiah does. Why not read a Bible passage that contains something like a doxology, they call it. In other words, a long, wonderful prayer of how wonderful God is. Or maybe, you, if you like, you could sing a hymn or perhaps a worship song reminding you of how awesome or powerful or wonderful God is. Notice that then that Nehemiah's prayers also focus on who God is and how he treats his people. We're down in verse 5 now. He says how loving God is, how faithful God is to those who are faithful to him. Nehemiah is filling his prayers with his God, not his problems. I don't know about you, but my prayers are full of people with problems and situations that need resolving. So there's a challenge here for you and I, isn't there? Perhaps we need to spend more time in our quiet times meditating on who God is before we start praying to him. You could perhaps this week try using Isaiah chapter 6, 1 to 5. It's full of a most marvellous picture of God. Why not read that at the beginning of your quiet time to make sure that God is bigger than the problems you're about to pray for? Of course, sometimes, though, it's really hard, isn't it, to magnify God and to shrink your problems by praying. Sometimes we can be in a season of life where we're full of fear or maybe we're just too ill. But in those seasons of life, we can still ask other people to pray for us, people who can still pray big. In 2012, a lady uh, called Tony, who was in her 40s, who was in my house group, was diagnosed with Burkitt's lymphoma. It's a particularly aggressive form of cancer. It put her in hospital for over seven months. During that time, she suffered pancreatitis, even though she never drank. She endured three weeks of diarrhea. She lost five stone in weight. And she experienced so much muscle wastage that she couldn't lift a glass of water by the end. At that time, of course, she couldn't even pray. But she could, as she did, ask her church to pray for her. People who had more faith in that time than she did for herself. Miraculously, Tony survived. And I'm pleased to say that she's now back at work in HR. But she is sad to say that the five stone is also back, mainly on her hips. <laughs> when you pray, keep your God bigger than your problems. As an aside, perhaps not uh, really, I shouldn't really be going here, but I can't help noticing that Nehemiah has such a big vision of God that it naturally leads him into confession, doesn't it? Again, you might want to have a look at verses 6 and 7 this week. Every week in our services, confession plays a really essential part in our worship because it enables us to clear the air between us and God. That's why we always have it often at the outset of our service. It unburdens us, doesn't it? But I think that confession should pray, play an equally similar and important role in our personal quiet times. I wonder if you confess daily. Nehemiah's vision of God is so vast that it enables him to see himself and God's people in comparison to this wonderful God. And so as we read in verse 6, Nehemiah even confesses on behalf of the very people that he's praying for, just as Joel did. I don't know about you, but this is something I never do. But I'm challenged to think further about it as a result of this passage. But this week, when we pray, let's make sure that we keep God big. Lastly, we see that Nehemiah waits on God. Nehemiah waits on God. Having committed himself to praying, having taken his burdens to God and not to people, having magnified his vision of God and shrunk his problems, Nehemiah finally takes his request to God. Grant me a favourable reaction with this man, he says in verse 11. By now, in his heart, Nehemiah knows exactly what he wants to do. 
He wants to return to Jerusalem. He wants to build up God's people. He wants to rebuild the holy city. That's a big ask, isn't it? In fact, we would be thinking that's too much to ask for. The king will never say yes to that. But notice that Nehemiah doesn't pray for the final outcome. He simply prays for the next step, doesn't he? A favourable reaction from the king is what he asks for. The best way to eat an elephant is in bite-sized chunks. Unlike us, Nehemiah doesn't suggest how God might answer his prayers. He doesn't proffer solutions that God might not have thought of. No, Nehemiah simply gives God the next step and then leaves it with him. But then he does something remarkable. Then he is willing to wait. The Kislev mentioned in verse 1 is November. The Nisan mentioned in verse 1 of chapter 2 is March. That means that though, although Nehemiah asked God for a favourable audience with the king on that day, he used the word today, didn't he, in verse 11, he then has to wait four months before his prayer is answered. But notice that during this time, Nehemiah says that he is praying day and night, as he puts it in verse 6. And eventually God answers that prayer and does the unlikely. What about you and I? How good are we at praying and then waiting? I'm useless at it. But whilst you're waiting, you can use that as a time of prayer, can't you? Believing that God is seeing and listening, even if nothing seems to be happening, verse 6. Because God is always doing way more than we can ever see. In the 1990s, I went to St Barnabas in Kensington. At that church, there was a beautiful, elegant woman in her 40s called Gabriella. She had two grown-up children. Her husband, an architect, had left her very near to the beginning of their marriage. Being beautiful, she'd had lots of offers of marriage, but she had refused them all. Because she believed that she was still married to her husband. So she prayed for him every day, even though by now he'd married the lady he'd had an affair with. Twenty years later, her ex-husband's wife left him. And one day he came back to Gabby and asked for her forgiveness. She forgave him. He became a Christian and she remarried him. Gabriella used the time of waiting to keep praying for the unlikely. A few years ago, my prayer partner Lester and I decided to pray for his daughter Catherine in a more concentrated way. After university, she'd gone away from God and had moved in with a chap who wasn't a Christian. We decided to pray for her every week to become a Christian, and him as well, of course. At that time, this seemed pretty unlikely. After all, she was a bit of a woman of the world, tall, striking, with big blonde hair. But we prayed for her every week for about five years. During that time, her boyfriend didn't alpha, yet in truth wasn't really interested. He just did it to please us. But two years ago, Catherine gradually started coming back to church. She split with her boyfriend. She recommitted her life to Jesus Christ. She went on a Christian dating site, where she met a tall, striking man with big hair, mostly on his face, (laughs) whom she then married about three months ago. Nehemiah faced an overwhelming situation that must have seemed unlikely to be resolved to his satisfaction. But nonetheless, he commits himself to pray. And so he takes his burden to God and not to people. But Nehemiah also kept his God big, didn't he? So his prayer is full of God, not his requests. His prayer magnifies God and shrinks his problem. But after he's made his request of God, Nehemiah is willing to wait. Like us, though, he wants his prayer answered on the day, the very day he prays it. But unlike us, he's willing to wait on God, turning the waiting time into prayer time. Eventually, the unimaginable does happen. The Babylonian king allows Nehemiah to return to Jerusalem, the very Jerusalem that the previous king had destroyed. The king also gives him diplomatic letters in order to protect him, and even funds the city's reconstruction. All of which should encourage you and I this week to keep praying for the unlikely.